Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Please remember to sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations and give us any ideas that you might have in regards to uh, topics that you'd like to hear about or speakers that you'd like to hear. Uh, today it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Warmey who's been a uh, frequent contributor recently to Grand Rounds. Um, Dr. Warmey is uh, both an orthopedist and a sports medicine specialist. He did his orthopedics residency at the University of Iowa, and then he did his uh, fellowship in sports medicine at the Hospital for Special Surgery in uh, New York. Um, he's here today to update us on sports medicine, knee surgery, and uh, beyond, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Warmey. You guys hear me with that? Okay, very good. I've done this enough times now that uh, Tim trusts me to put my mic on myself. I wasn't quite ready for that step yet, but I think it, we got it figured out. Um, well, thanks for having me again. Uh, I think that I will be, um, let's see, let me go back and forward. Uh, we're kind of uh, gearing up for the fall, and the summer's kind of our uh, slow time. So uh, with Iowa State coming back and all the high schools uh, coming back next fall, this is a good time to, for me to squeeze in another talk. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, some of the different things that I learned in uh, my fellowship with regards to uh, knee surgery, and specifically, you know, uh, what we've, and when, when I say we, what researchers and not me myself uh, have uh, contributed to the field of uh, knee arthroscopy over the last 10 years or so and what's kind of new, what's out there, what's on the horizon and, and um, what I think uh, is really valuable for patients that I think that, you know, everybody who takes care of patients from, you know, the inpatient side to the physical therapy to uh, referring providers and all of those people, it's, it's just good to know, you know, what, what, what we can do now with the uh, arthroscope. This is a picture of uh, the group. I just got back from uh, a, a, the Big 12 team positions meeting, and I wanted to note our uh, orthopedic chairman, Dr. Buck, front and center there. I was, it was fun to uh, spend a couple, four days with him down there, although it was about 115 degrees, and I'd rather have snow than heat like that. So anyway, I'm going to uh, go over uh, four different topics today and kind of give you an update on what we're doing now, um, you know, and how we've kind of pushed things and made progress with what our uh, treatment modalities. So the first one is uh, ACL reconstruction. This is really bread and butter uh, sports medicine. And, uh, you know, AC we've been doing ACLs over the last uh, three decades or so. And in general, about 90% of ACL reconstructions are successful. And by that, I mean that about 90% of the time, literature would show that we get patients back to um, their previous, their pre-injury level of play and competition uh, and uh, pain level. Um, but we're always looking for ways to do it better uh, and get patients back quicker. And one of the, the new things that we're doing now is is taking a ACL surgery, which used to be two large incisions, and then it was an incision and a arthroscopic procedure to now where we can do it in certain instances uh, strictly with arthroscopy without making any incisions at all. Um, so I just, I'm going to do this in a case presentation style to kind of highlight the different techniques that, that we have now. Um, this was a 48-year-old female who had a knee injury uh, and uh, came to my clinic about a month out from that and basically she was trying to get, get by and get back into her work. Um, but kept having these knee instability episodes where the knee would completely give out. And I uh, saw her primary care doctor who was concerned about some type of ligamentous injury. The MRI showed a uh, ACL tear. I'll show you that two slices here. So um, on the right, you see this is what uh, is remaining of the ACL ligament. The PCL of what you can see on this slice is right here. So a nice healthy ligament is black on this particular sequence and here it's this ACL is completely disrupted um, and this is a 
MRI that shows some bone bruising or edema. And this is pretty typical for a ACL injury. Uh, we call these kissing lesions, but basically when, the, when a patient has an instability episode or a pivoting episode from ACL deficiency, the tibia and the femur rotate on each other and then they uh, collide and cause this contusion. Characteristically, here on the femur and here on the tibia, in patients with chronic ACL tears, sometimes you see this on MRI, but they haven't had a pivot mechanism or a, a uh, slip recently, they won't have these. So this tells me that this is an acute injury uh, with that tear. One of the uh, topics that came up when I was discussing the, the uh, surgery with this patient, um, she wanted to get back to skiing, but uh, cosmesis was a concern for her with uh, she has had some dermatologic issues and, and skin reactions and some healing issues. And so, and, and she just, you know, wanted to see, she was concerned about cosmesis. And I, I discussed with her that uh, there is this new way of doing ACLs where we can do it all through the scope. And it's basically four little uh, portal sites. And she was interested in doing that. So I'm gonna kind of show you, this is a uh, animation. If this doesn't work, I have it loaded on the desktop. If this doesn't work, we'll try it. There it goes. So one portal site's up here, one's to pass this, one's down here, and one's over here. This is sort of an outside-in flip cutter device that we call that we. So this is a small little tunnel that we or a small little drill we place on the outside of the femur, and then this has the drill inside the sheath, and we can actually flip that, and then instead of drilling a tunnel that goes all the way through the bone, this is just a socket. There's still bone preserved on the lateral aspect of the femur here. And you'll see in a similar fashion, it'll be a socket on the tibia as well. It won't be a full tunnel. So basically the same thing where there's bone preserved on the anterior cortex of the tibia, and it's just these sockets, and they're not true tunnels. I'll get to why that's important here in just a little bit, but then through one of the anterior portal sites, we can pass our graft. And then there's just a small uh, metal button fixation on the. This is showing that you can, with this particular technique, you can actually retension uh, your graft after you cycle the knee. So. Um, basically, with this technique, you're able to do everything inside the knee uh, without any incisions and then being able to tension the knee after you cycle it. So one thing that happens with ACL reconstructions as it stands right now is we put our grafts in and lots of times soft tissue grafts can stretch somewhat. Um, and so after we place them, we hold them in tension and cycle the knee. But this device actually allows us to, with a finger trap mechanism, um, capture that ligament and we can even make it tauter after we've cycled the knee, if we want to make it even tighter than what it, what it is. So this is what the, the x-rays look like. I think you can, I'm not sure if you can make it out from where you guys are, but you can see that the, the tunnel kind of ends right, or the socket is right here, and then there's just a small little hole where the sutures are passed right there, and the same thing right here. So what, what advantage is it for this? Um, this is the what the skin incisions looks like. This is the same knee, and this is not... Uh, this patient, it's another patient of mine. I didn't have her uh, post-op pictures, but uh, lateral side here, medial side here, same thing, lateral side, medial side. So it's four little, uh, basically, portal sites. One to uh, pass the drill here, one to pass the drill here, and then two arthroscopic sites there. So it, there's a cosmetic advantage, uh, and there's, there's less trauma to the skin, less healing time, uh, less inflammatory less of an inflammatory reaction from the uh, uh, the healing process associated with that. But there's some other things, too. Um, first of all, uh, we do this with a single tendon. Uh, and so in a typical uh, soft tissue ACL reconstruction, we take two of the hamstring tendons. Uh, usually it's the gracilis and the uh, semitendinosus from the, the inside of the knee. 
with this particular technique, since we're using sockets and not full tunnels, uh, we only have to take one of those. So there's uh, a theoretic advantage of less donor site or less harvest site uh, mobility um, because you preserve uh, more of the anatomy where you harvest. Um, you can also, like we d discussed, uh, you can you can tension the, the knee after you're, you're, you're done with surgery, you've tested the stability, you've cycled the knee, and you just wanted to get it a little bit tighter. Well, traditionally, if you place screws, that's it, and you can't do anything more unless you take the screw out and, and do it all over with this. You can actually, because of the finger trap, Chinese finger trap sort of mechanism, you're able to actually cinch it down even tighter if you want. Um, this is a little bit anecdotal, but it's starting to play out uh, in papers that are coming out in 2013 that uh, there is there does seem to be a little bit uh, faster rehabilitation process. And the current idea is, is because we're not doing full tunnels um, and not blowing out the lateral femoral cortex, not going all the way through the anterior tibial cortex, that keeps all of those healing factors inside those sockets, and there's no egress of those uh, through the tunnels. And then there's no pain associated with actually going through the, the cortical bone. Um, and so uh, certainly in my experience, I've done this uh, probably 10 times or so since I've been here and um, I've had good success with it. I will say that um, in my practice in competitive athletes and especially contact competitive athletes, I still uh, favor the bone, patella tendon bone, uh, autograft that is tried and true has been around for two decades and we with the bone plugs you get bone to, from the graft to heal to the bone in the tunnel and it's just very very reliable so um but i'm starting to do this more and more and i think that in the next uh, you know several years as more and more research comes out uh, this will become more mainstream for acl reconstruction so that's what's new on the acl front I'm um, going to talk a little bit about patella instability as well. Any questions before I leave the ACL realm? You can ask questions anytime. So patella instability, there's some new uh, things that we can do for that. Um, just to get you oriented here, this patient's head is here, the feet are down here, and the patella is kind of sliding off. Here's the shin. Um, but there's some, there's some new things that we can do uh, that are relatively new. Um, to help stabilize a unstable patella or kneecap. Um, for this particular case, this is a 28-year-old female who uh, has had a, a five-year history of recurrent uh, kneecap dislocations. They've always gone lateral. Uh, and it got to the point where, you know, uh, going up and down stairs, sometimes this patella would slip out and... Uh, any type of physical activity would cause her pain up in the front of the knee. And so uh, certainly for somebody like her, there, there was reasons to discuss, you know, what options we have to help stabilize the patella. This is her uh, preoperative imaging. I wanted to call your attention to one structure that comes into play with one of these new techniques. This is uh, a ligament right here called the MPFL. That's the medial patella femoral ligament, MPFL. So we use lots of acronyms in orthopedics, the ACL, the PCL, the LCL. This is the MPFL, and that stands for medial, meaning medial side of the knee, patellofemoral, meaning patella femur ligament, so MPFL. So that serves as a check rein to keep the kneecap from coming off the lateral side, and that's the direction most uh, patella dislocations occur. You can see here that this and it has signal in it. This bright signal is attenuation and fluid, and then it's uh, disrupted here right at the insertion. So a um, couple of things. There's, uh, this case highlights two different techniques that, that we can use to help stabilize the patella. Um, the, one of them involves uh, what we call a fulcrum osteotomy, and that is meant to address this phenomenon that we call the Q angle. So basically for the patella, um, the pole of the patella is the quadriceps muscles that are all up in front of the thigh. They all insert through the quadriceps tendon on, on the kneecap or the patella. And then all those forces get transmitted through the patella tendon, which goes from the kneecap down to the tibial tubercle where that attaches. So basically 
all the forces that the patella sees are created by the quadriceps muscles here and transmitted to the tibial tubercle down here. So this is a cross-section axial view and that shows the tibial tubercle there. The, the majority of the quadriceps muscles attach up here and so their line of pull to the patella is along the axis of the femur. So that's this axis. Most people, and especially in women, uh, there, is, there is not a linear relationship between the pull of the quadriceps muscles and the patella tibial tubercle uh, profile. And that's called the Q angle. Uh, women have wider hips on average than men uh, to uh, allow for uh, childbirth. And that sets their quadriceps pull out farther. So men would maybe be here, and it's a little bit more of a direct line down to their tibial tubercle. But here, for women, uh, their pull through the quadriceps comes here, and then it has to kind of make a turn around the knee to the tibial tubercle. You can imagine that as somebody flexes and tightens, this is connected to here, and there's no other connections. So it's the quadriceps connection to the proximal part of the femur, and then the patella tendon connects to the tibial tubercle. There's no other connections. And so when you shorten these muscles during a muscle contraction, that line wants to go through here, and that pulls the patella lateral. So there's a measurement that we take in uh, with CT, and it's called the TTTG distance, another acronym in orthopedics. Um, but that is the tibial tubercle. That's the TT. Here's the tibial tubercle that's right there. And then the TG is the trochlear groove, and that is behind the patella right there. And these two images are superimposed so that I know that uh, on the XY axis here, this is uh, in the same plane. And then we measure that distance, basically that distance. So here the tibial tubercle is right here, and then the trochlear groove is about right there, and we measure that XY distance. If that's greater than 20 millimeters, uh, Orthopedic literature would suggest that there's a good surgery for that to shift this tubule tubercle back over here so it's more of a straight line pull. So basically moving that over medially so that this is a true linear pull uh, on that, that line of uh, muscle contraction. So this is called a Fulk Fulker. There's lots of different uh, variations on this. The one I use is called a Fulkerson osteotomy. Uh, but basically we can... Um, cut the tibial tubercle and then slide it medially to improve that angle so that it's more of a linear relationship and there's less tendency for the kneecap to want to come out lateral. So this is what this looks like in this patient uh, after surgery. There's lots of variations on it. The one that I use is the Fulkerson so I can actually not only do I medialize the tibial tubercle but I also anteriorize it just a little bit to, to decrease the contact pressures on the articular cartilage in the patella. The other thing uh, that we did for this particular patient was we did a reconstruction of this MPFL ligament and that serves as a check rein. As you can see now the the lateral retinaculum is still uh, intact and so when it, this MPFL is ruptured and uh, deficient or attenuated there's nothing keeping that from coming out, especially with extension and quad contraction. So this is sort of a schem schematic of what the graph looks like after we put it in, and that's meant to hold it uh, more medial so it doesn't go lateral. So I like videos. We're going to try another one just to kind of give you an idea of what this surgery looks like. This one's working too. So it's just a real careful dissection through uh, the layers of the medial knee. And then under x-ray guidance, I pass two pins. I make sure those pins don't go into the joint and are perfectly seated in the middle of the patella. And I only go to about right here because I don't want to cause a stress riser that could lead to a fracture that, that comes all the way across the patella. So these, are, again, are sockets that go about that far. And then the MPFL ligament attaches down here 
near a structure that we call the medial femoral epicondyle. So after we place these, place this graft, so here's our graft. So we'll dock it in the patella. And to make sure we get the exact right spot, we use fluoroscopy to get our starting spot for the femoral attachment. And then we drill a little hole to dock this, I call this the knuckle of the graft, down and dock it into that. So this is a passing stitch that we take underneath the soft tissues and the layers that the, the native MPFL lives. And then we can hold tension by pulling that through to the other side of the knee. This needs to be isometric because on these two things, so when we take the knee through a range of motion, this has to uh, keep the knee cap from dislocating, but it can't be over tight, and so that's why we call it a check rein rather than actually putting it on tension. So this works really, really well to stabilize the knee, and in conjunction with the Fulkerson osteotomy, uh, let's see if I can back up here. So you can see here's one of my drill holes and here's the other one. So in conjunction, I've done the MPFL reconstruction for her and then also uh, done this Fulkerson osteotomy. And this is uh, a tried and true technique over the last decade or so. The MPFL part of that procedure is, is, is relatively new. And one of my uh, fellowship mentors called this the MPFL surgery, the surgery of the decade of, of uh, 2000 to 2010 as far as advancements in orthopedics. So um, patella instability is fairly common and we're starting to figure out good ways to uh, treat it surgically if it gets to that point. I treat patients conservatively for a first time dislocation, but if they have a recurrent dislocation, then I think it's worthwhile to get imaging and see what factors have led to the instability. So there's lots of different factors that can create a situation where the patella can be potentially unstable. One of them is the excessive Q angle that we talked about. Uh, another is having an MPFL injury. So our patient had both of those. The uh, trochlear groove uh, can be flat and not hold it very well. And then the patella can actually sit high up in the thigh as well. So there's lots of different reasons uh, for patellas to be potentially unstable. And uh, you know, one of the clinical pearls I would say is, is that, uh, you know, every patella instability case is completely different. We have to take, there, there's not uh, one answer to fix all of these. And these are the four most common reasons. And sometimes uh, there are, are three of these acting at once. In this case, there were the first two were acting at once. And so um, I would just say that from a clinical pearls perspective, uh, there's lots of reasons why the patella can be unstable. Another one that I didn't put here is systemic joint laxity or you know underlying loose collagen, that kind of thing is another one. Um, so that's patella instability. Any questions on that before I jump to the next one? Go ahead. So did you ever do the MPFL reconstruction Yeah, so if, absolutely, I would. If this distance here was less than 20, let's say it was 10, I, I wouldn't be able to help her much by doing that, and it's pretty normal. Uh, in cases when uh, the patella is higher up, so this patella alta, so if the patella sits up here, there's not much of a groove there to hold it in, and that can be very unstable. So in that case, I would consider either using orthopedic tools to create a groove instead of having it be flat, or doing the isolated MPFL. So uh, yeah, there's definitely indications for just doing a isolated MPFL. This is a lot of surgery for somebody to go through to cut the tibial tubercle and move it and then to fix it. It's basically like having a tibia fracture and getting that to heal. So it's a lot of surgery to put somebody through if you don't think it's going to be a, a, a huge benefit. 
All right, this is a, one of my most recent cases and, and one that I probably spent more time thinking about and reading about than any case I've done since I've been here. Uh, this is a 12-year-old who, um, like the last patient, had patella instability, but it turns out that when he was dislocating his patella, it was traumatic enough that his patella was impacting the condyle as it dislocated on the lemoral, lateral femoral condyle, and so this bone here is a piece of bone that came off of the lateral femoral condyle. So this is what we call an osteochondral defect. Um, osteo meaning bone, chondral meaning cartilage. So there's, you don't see it on x-ray, but there's actually cartilage on the side of this. And so that's uh, the term that, or the acronym we use for this is OCD. OCD has two sort of confusing meanings. One is osteochondritis desiccans and one is osteochondral defect. In general, they kind of relate to the same thing. And so I just use osteochondral defect uh, in general audiences and that's an easy way to think about it. But basically, in a 12-year-old kid, you can see he has open growth plates here. Uh, and this piece measured three centimeters by two centimeters. That is a significant portion of the articular cartilage and the bone on the surface of that joint that he's missing. And um, really this knee is doomed to arthritis and big time problems if we, if we can't figure out a good solution for that. Um, further, so the other thing was is he couldn't fully extend the knee when I first saw him and, and more than likely this was getting stuck in the notch and preventing full extension. He had uh, two distinct uh, patella dislocations, one a year ago, both and then one this spring. Both times it was uh, playing baseball, and he was actually just uh, fielding a, a ground ball and then going into the throwing motion. And that sort of twisting motion of going from the fielding the grounder to throwing, somehow he dislocated his uh, patella and created this fracture when that patella went out the back or went out the, the uh, lateral side. So here's uh, imaging. MRI, you can see that defect here. So this measured uh, approximately three centimeters, and I can show you intraoperative, and then about two centimeters in the uh, coronal plane. This is a, a big chunk of articular cartilage is gone. So, uh, you know, it's something that we, we have to address. So how do we do that uh, in 2013? There's a lot of different ways to address that. Um, if this person were 55 or 60, um, we would hold on and let them live their life and do all their activities and then do a knee replacement, at which point they felt like their quality of life had suffered enough. But in somebody who's 12, knee replacement's not an ideal option because knee replacements wear out. They're not perfect knees. They're a mechanical knee. And uh, doing a knee replacement somebody that's 12 would... Uh, require multiple revision surgeries down the line. So ideally we, we would do something to get this to heal or to uh, be some sort of a biologic uh, surface there. So I did an arthroscopy and this is the, the piece after we took it out. And because there was bone on the surface, here's the, where the defect came from. This is a three millimeter probe. So you can see it was basically three centimeters in the AP dimension and two centimeters in the coronal medial lateral dimension. After I cleaned up sort of this fibrinous tissue, I was able to put it back in that defect and uh, it fit pretty nice. And so we went ahead and tried to fix it. It's a, we took a little bit of a gamble and I had a multiple visits with the family leading up to this, telling them all the different options that we would have and that I would make a game time decision based on the piece and what I thought was right. Um, but there is no right answer, but in his case, I felt like there was enough bone there that we could get uh, try to get this to heal back to this defect in the bone base. So put it on and then uh, used a chondral dart system to uh, fix that. Um, this is just arthroscopic images of what it looks like after we had the piece back in. And then uh, while we were in the operating room, I took fluoro to see what the contour of the knee looked like. This is... Uh, so going in, we had this picture with, you know, this big defect right there. And then the OR, 
uh, it's a little bit hard to see here, but here's uh, what I thought was a pretty smooth transition there. And here, down here is kind of where you can see where we put that piece. You can see it better on the post-op radiographs. I'll show you those next, I think. So this column is before surgery. This column is after surgery. Um, on this AP view, it looks pretty nice and nice and smooth. On the lateral view, it's not pr a perfect contour, but I'm got my fingers crossed that this will will continue to fill in and then remember there's articular cartilage on this too. So he's 12 and I think that there's a decent chance that this will heal. Uh, the family knows that it, it might not and we might have to do something more down the line. With his growth plates being open, um, one technique that we can do in older people but not in him because of the open growth plates is we can uh, take a cylinder of bone from here in the trochlea where there's not a lot of contact pressure, but it has good articular cartilage on it. So we could take a cylinder of bone here and then transplant it down here. But because he has open growth plates, he's 12. His dad was uh, well over a foot taller than he was. He has a lot of growth left. The, the majority of growth in the human body happens at the knee and the most of the knee growth happens at the distal femur. So this is like the number one growth plate for height in a, in a 12 year old boy. And we wanted to try and not violate that if we could with the surgery. So um, other things that I was thinking about, if this was a non-viable piece, uh, we could do a you know bone grafting and then a marrow stimulation, marrow stimulation, stimulation technique where we try and get marrow elements to grow scar tissue called fibrocartilage out here. Um, but it's, it's not as good as if we can get this to heal. Um, the alternative and what we had you know, sort of on backup in the OR was actually using a cadaver knee and sizing this perfectly and then make a dowel from the cadaver knee to put in there. Um, but I felt like this was healthy enough bone that we had a shot at getting this to heal. And if we can get that to heal, then it would definitely be a win for him. So this is sort of the, the end of what that looks like as we had this big three by 20 and then these absorbable chondral darts, as they're called. And so these are made out of PLLA, which over a couple of years will dissolve. So that's one of the things we do for uh, cartilage defects. What are some clinical pearls? Um, these were the two things that I was thinking about going in was either repair it or uh, marrow simulation with microfracture. But we did have transplant available. I prefer to do autograft transplant, but for him with open growth plates, harvesting the uh, donor plugs was risky to the growth plate. So we had allograft on, on backup. In the future, I think that uh, lots of companies are working on uh, things that we can implant to help stimulate cartilage growth. We haven't figured it out yet, but this is probably, I would say, more than anywhere else in orthopedic research. This is where the, the focus is on cartilage and preserving cartilage and trying to prevent arthritis. So on the horizon, I think that there will be some, some uh, implantable or injectable things to try and get that cartilage to, to heal, which would, would be slick and easy to do with a scope, we think. So, All right, I got one more here for you. Any questions on osteochondral defects? Okay. So um, the most common orthopedic procedure we do uh, in the 21st century is meniscectomies. And so you all have heard of that and all know what that is and are all familiar with the meniscus. Um, the only thing I wanted to bring to your attention is, is that the, the meniscus is a very important structure and taking it out, it, although it makes patients feel a lot better and it's a very predictable surgery, it's not necessarily a benign thing for the joint and especially for the joint's future. And so in the correct situations, the correct scenarios, if, if you are able to do a meniscus repair and get it to heal, uh, the joint is gonna be much better off 20 years down the line. The, the downside is is that the, the, it's a very narrow indication for when we think that a meniscus, trans, or meniscus repair is likely to heal. And in the best case scenarios, when all the stars align, there's only about a 70% healing rate. So that's why 
sometimes you do a meniscus repair and you think that you've got everything teed up, but then a year later you're doing the menis meniscectomy at that point anyway. So, but because the meniscus is really important and it, it, there's a lot of functions that it does, number and most importantly is uh, helps preserve contact pressures and knee biomechanics in homeostasis so that it prevents arthritis. If we can repair menisci, there's a good chance that we can, uh, the knee's gonna be better off 20 years down the road. So I just wanted to highlight that with the case. Again, the, the indications are very narrow for trying this, um, but this is, it. so one of the important things for predictability of meniscus healing is that the patient is very young. Um, certainly less than 30 and even less than 25 is the ideal for getting the meniscus to heal. Um, so this is a, the medial side of the knee. These are sagittal images, and here's a meniscus tear that you can see on T1 and T2. This patient, um, let me back up so I don't misspeak. So she was 18 and had an acute injury. So just a quick review of why most menisci don't heal. It, a large part of that is because there isn't a, a very much blood supply to the inner aspect of the meniscus. So in orthopedics, we break up the meniscus into three zones, the red zone on the periphery, the white zone on the inner aspect, which is avascular, and then the transition between that we call the red-white zone. So red-red, red-white, white-white. Um, and really only tears that happen out here on the very periphery of the meniscus are the ones that have a shot at healing. So this is a, a cross section of what it would look like if we did a cross section right here. Um, so here is where the capillaries live. As you get closer to the center of the knee, it's more and more avascular. So it's really only the tears that happen out in the periphery are the ones that <clears throat> have a chance for healing. Coincidentally, those are the ones that are the, the most problematic if they don't heal and if you have to take them out. So a really big meniscus tear along the side, if you take that out, that's going to drastically change the kinematics and the, and the joint contact reaction forces in the knee, uh, which basically means that they're at risk for developing arthritis prematurely. So the meniscus tear pattern is very important. Um, the tear pattern that, that I think is the, the right time to try is if you have a longitudinal vertical tear like this. This is a, a what we call a radial tear, and that does not uh, typically do well. A horizontal tear is a, a poor uh, figure, but this is just showing a tear that would come in the plane of the meniscus, both posteriorly and anteriorily, um, and then an oblique tear. It's these acute longitudinal tears that are vertical in nature are the ones, and then the ones that are in the periphery are the ones that have the best chance uh, of healing. Um, so here's our 18-year-old, and what I'm trying to show here is I, I've got a small little rasp inside this tear. So here is meniscus, here's the capsule, femoral condyle, and the meniscus goes from here all the way to here. So this is a peripheral tear right here. This is the capsule where it attaches to the capsule on the medial side. So our tear is running longitudinally. It's a vertical tear. She's 18. The rest of the knee looks perfect. And so for her, if I took this knee, if this meniscus out without at least trying, then, you know, I ethically it's tough for me to do that, just kind of dooming her to uh, premature arthritis. And so going, you know, I, Every time I take a patient to the OR where I think there's a chance that I can repair this, we have a long conversation about, well, do you want me to try, knowing that 70% of these in the best case scenarios work and 30% of the time they don't work. And if it doesn't work, then we would have to go back and, and then take it out. Um, that's just a conversation that I have, and my job is to educate them and help them make a good choice. And if they choose, they want me to attempt it. And when I get in there, it looks like it's repairable, then I'll do it. If not, then we, uh, then we take it out. But anyway, this is... Uh, Kind of what it looked like at surgery. One more video. See if we get this one to work very good. So this is all arthroscopic. Uh, two decades ago, it would have been a big incision on the outside of the knee to dissect to get there. But now we could do this all through uh, two little portal sites up front. All of the uh, orthopedic companies have devices to do this. This is just one of them that I'm showing here. Um, 
So this is a peripheral vertical tear. And this is a basically a horizontal mattress stitch. This is the same type of material that we use for our anchors in the shoulder and the knee. And you can imagine that if the alternative to doing this repair is taking the meniscus out, which in order to create a smooth margin, it would have been something like this. So that would have been, uh, you know, a substantial portion of the meniscus and, and you know, left or at risk for uh, premature arthritis. So she uh, had a concomitant ACL injury and um, had a pivoting episode about a month ago. And so we wanted, so I got an MRI to look at the integrity of the um, ACL. And that gave me a chance to look at the, what the meniscus looks like. So here's when she injured it. And then this is T2 and T1, I think. And then same thing here. This is, this is afterwards. So this is six months afterwards. You can see that little implant right there. Um, but she has no symptoms along the medial joint line. And, and I think that this is reassuring to me that this is uh, likely to be successful. This has got contrast in it. So this really bright contrast fluid would have leaked up into that tear area if it hadn't healed. So I think that this is very favorable that at least in this setting, uh, we were able to get this to heal. And you can imagine if we took that out, how much meniscus we would have had it taken out and how little we would have left her with. So um, what are the clinical pearls here? Not very many meniscus tears are repairable, and even the ones that are ideal, um, not all of them heal. But it, the meniscus does play an important function, and I think that any time that, that a meniscus is potentially repairable, you have to at least consider it. Um, this is, these are the people that do the best or have the most likely healing. It's young patients. The tear is peripheral out here where the capillaries are. Uh, it's a vertical tear like this. So the horizontal tear that I was trying to show would be a tear like this. And that I think that you can do well by just taking one of the leaflets out. Um, and then interestingly enough, uh, if you do a concomitant ACL reconstruction, the time of the meniscus repair, that seems to increase the chances that it'll heal. The reason for that, we think, is that when you uh, drill those sockets or those tunnels, you're releasing a lot of elements from the marrow that are chock full of platelets and growth factors and everything else. And so we think that the, that the biologic milieu, if you will, is makes it even more favorable for meniscus healing in that situation. So anyway, just, uh, you know, four cases about things that, you know, that may contrast how you've thought about these type of injuries are um, different than when you went through med school or whatever and, and um, things that we're doing now. I think that uh, orthopedics, as much as any specialty, is a an evolving specialty. And 10 years from now, these things will all be different, but hopefully better. And uh, we're just trying to stay on the cutting edge of them. So go ahead. Favorite clinical uh, uh, way clinically to diagnose meniscus involvement? So uh, clinically, um, joint line tenderness is very sensitive. There's a test where you can uh, put the patient in a provocative position by hyperflexing the knee and then um, rotating the heel in and out and then coming from extension to full extension. It's called the McMurray's uh, maneuver. Those two tests um, combined are about 80% sensitive. So if I've got a patient that has both of those that are positive, chances are there's a meniscus tear. Uh, the ar argument can be made in today's economic environment, do you have to do an MRI before taking somebody to the operating room? Um, I think that for preoperative planning, the MRI is really nice. So you can, you can have a conversation about whether or not you think that the location and everything else and the, the geometry of the tear is a repairable one or not. Um, but those two tests in my, are the two tests that I rely on the most for meniscus and it's about 80% sensitive or so. So it's pretty good. So uh, classically McMurray's is, has to be positive for an audible pop or a click. I call, in my notes, I'll, in my mind, I'll say McMurray's caused pain, McMurray's caused a mechanical catching or McMurray's uh, caused an audible or palpable click. 
So an audible or palpable click is the true McMurray's, but if it, if it causes them significant pain, or especially if it causes them mechanical symptoms, in my mind, that's very indicative of a tear. Yeah. So, well, thanks for having me. I've, this is my third one, and I, most of the surgeries I do are on hip, knee, and shoulder, so I'm out of topics to talk about, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and uh, be an annual contributor to the conference going forward. So anyway, thanks for having me.